Back in 2014, I experienced something I still can't explain. I was still living at home at the time as an only child. I didn't have many friends or any hobbies to speak of, so I spent most of my free time surfing the internet and looking for anything that could hold my attention. On the weekends, I would wait for my parents to leave the house. Then, like most teenagers, I would use the alone time to browse through a more devious content. On the night that this unexplainable thing happened, I was getting up to the same thing I always did. When I was finally home alone, I closed my door and drew my curtains, turned the lights off and grabbed a box of tissues from the bathroom, uh, in case I got a runny nose while I was watching what I was finally able to watch now that nobody was around. My parents said they would be gone all night, though I knew I could stay at it for as long as I wanted. Of course, that meant that there were quite a few soiled and crumpled up tissues tossed into the bin, but after a couple hours I was pretty much drained and bored of just watching stuff by myself like I did every weekend, and I was starting to wish I had someone to talk to. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't have very many friends, and certainly nobody that I could call close. The handful of people I could think of to text never even read my messages, so rather than beg the people I sort of knew at the time to talk to me, I figured I'd have better luck with strangers. I I had already known about Omegle for some time by then, mostly by watching YouTubers exploring all the different tags you can add to your search for new friends, but I'd never used it myself. I didn't have friends because of my social anxiety, and that bled over to video chatting too, which I wasn't super comfortable with in the beginning, especially since they were all strangers. But it was better than tossing tissues all night, and I figured there was no way I'd ever see any of the people I met more than once, let alone run into them in person. Person, so I gave it a shot. Obviously, just like anyone else would see, my initial experience on Omega was getting flooded by a bunch of creepy old men asking for my ASL. I skipped over all those guys, and it really felt like I was trudging through an endless ocean of them. But even when I found somebody who looked decent, I would get skipped by them. It was only my first time on Omegle, but if it was supposed to be a place where you could talk to people, then that night was not a good night for it. All the freaks and weirdos seemed to be out, and I was starting to lose hope that I would ever find anybody <gasps> of interest. I thought about calling it quits, but then I felt like giving it just a few more tries. That's when I encountered the most unusual thing I'd seen all night. Whoever or whatever <gasps> they were, someone or something, they were creepier than any run-of-the-mill offense on Omegle. I was immediately so petrified by the image in front of me that I couldn't even click away from it. I just kept staring at the screen, trying to figure out what in the world I was looking at. I couldn't tell if they were wearing some kind of mask or a bunch of weird makeup. They barely looked human, and if they were, they were severely deranged. If I had to describe them, it looked like a male figure with deathly pale skin, dark sunken in eyes, and a strange scraggly haircut, like they were halfway dead and already starting to decompose. Then, out of the blue, the man started meowing, like he thought he was some sort of cat man. It creeped me out, but I was still suspecting that I was getting pranked somehow, although I had no idea how any of this was supposed to be funny. Hello? What's up with y you? Why don't you talk like a normal person? After I tried speaking to him, my computer screen started glitching out, and that's when the cat man jumped from the seat to the desk, landing backwards on all fours like it was about to start spider walking in front of the camera like the possessed girl from The Exorcist. It happened so fast that I flinched and fell off my chair, but I continued to watch from the floor, completely awestruck. The cat man stared right into the camera, except his face was upside down now from the position he was in. He was still meowing too, which just added to the uneasy feeling that was building about this whole situation. I'd seen so many horror movies and it felt like any one of them could come true at any moment. I half expected him to crawl out through the screen and reap my soul. What the hell do you want? Why are you doing that? Do you think this is funny, sicko? He didn't seem to care about what I said, and if he did, I think it was only upsetting him, because it was then that his head began to twitch as he slowly craned to the side until it was totally horizontal, all the while shrieking with one long meow, opening his mouth wider and wider to the point that it looked like he had inhumanly large set of jaws. 
What the hell is the matter with you? Stop meowing at me! I was horrified by whatever was about to happen next, but then the glitching of the screen got worse and uncontrollable and eventually froze, locking up the whole computer and forcing it to crash. I breathed a deep sigh of relief that the computer shut itself off. I was still dumbstruck in the darkness and sitting on the floor, so I have no idea how long I would have let that go on before I came to my senses and skipped that psycho. I eventually picked myself up and left my computer alone for the night, deciding to get some sleep and see if I couldn't forget the whole thing, or at least put some mental distance between me and it. It was difficult to get to sleep after being so shaken up, but I did get there after calming down for a little while. The next morning, things almost seemed alright. I could still vividly remember the strangeness of the Catman, his annoying meowing and corpse-like appearance, but other than that, everything seemed normal. That was, until I stood in front of the mirror before stepping into the shower and noticed the deep cat scratches all over my body. In my freshman year of college, I still lived with my mom. It was a small house in Fontana, California, near where I went to school. I didn't need to live in a dorm to get to know everybody in my classes. That's what things like Instagram were for, and I was upping my popularity by letting all the people I met at school follow me. I kept my profile up to date with posts and stories every day, taking selfies from pretty much everywhere I went, whether I was at the movies, at a fast food place, in class, or even at home. That's just what everyone was doing, and I didn't want to alienate myself, but that's when I would soon regret that decision. One evening, after a long day of classes, I got home and did my usual routine of studying and having dinner with my mom. I eventually got into bed, ready to pass out. That was when I heard my phone buzz on the nightstand, right as I was on the verge of falling asleep. I figured it was probably nothing, but I reached over and checked the notification, just in case it was a text from someone important. Unfortunately, it wasn't. It was just Instagram letting me know that I had another new follower. I was groggy and could barely read the username, but it was something like, at Jonathan W, and then a bunch of random numbers and characters. That, and the fact that they didn't have a profile picture, made it clear that this was not somebody who went to school with me. My curiosity led me to check out his page, and so I did. I could see that he was following hundreds of accounts but didn't have a single follower of his own. There wasn't even a bio or a link to anything. However, there were a few posts on his account. As I began scrolling, I noticed all the posts were of the same thing. A confusingly close-up shot of some kind of cotton upholstery stapled onto wood planks, like he was some kind of construction worker. The only difference between any of them was that it looked like some of them were taken at night, while others were taken from the daytime. I figured the account was either just some bot or maybe some random weirdo, so I put down my phone and tried to go back to sleep. Not even a minute later, my phone buzzed again. This time when I checked, it was a DM from the same guy that read, Hey baby. I immediately realized that it wasn't a bot, but an actual person. I decided to respond back with, Who's this? Admittedly, replying to him wasn't the best idea, but I wasn't thinking about the fact that he would be able to see when I read his messages after that. However, after a few minutes, he didn't respond with anything, so I put my phone down again and tried to get some sleep. I was just starting to doze off when I heard my phone. Yet again, this time, I ignored it. It annoyed me to think I was about to lose much needed sleep just to interact with some Instagram creep. I figured if I stopped reading his messages, he would get bored and move on like most of them do, but that wasn't the case. A minute later, there was another notification. My sleepiness was already spoiled by how irritated I was, so I checked it out with the intentions of blocking him. But what I saw made me realize that I was getting dragged into something far more serious than I had anticipated. He sent a candid picture of me at school. A chill ran down my spine. In the picture, I was in the outfit I was wearing earlier that day, but I had no idea I was being photographed by anybody but myself and my friends. He sent it with a caption that read, Do you like this candid shot I got of you today? 
All of a sudden, this situation with seemingly just a harmless weirdo turned into something far more terrifying. I didn't know what to do, so I sent him a harsh text cussing him out. Who the hell are you? Leave me the f*** alone or I'll send this to the cops! Then as soon as I sent the message, I blocked the account so he didn't have time to respond. I threw down my phone for the last time and tried to finally get some sleep. But I was so horrified thinking that I now had a stalker on my hands. I had no idea who he was or how long it had been going on. Yet, somehow, I managed to put myself in enough denial about the whole thing and fell asleep. In the morning, however, I remembered everything. I told my mom about the whole ordeal before I left the house, and I could tell she was concerned for me, but also just as clueless as I was. I talked to my friends about it at school, but none of them have ever dealt with anything like this before either. Thankfully, when I got home, my mom had this idea of setting up a couple of home security cameras around the house. Neither of us knew what this creep was capable of, so she figured we'd have the extra measure of safety to help me feel safer. We made sure to put one of the cameras in my bedroom just before I went to bed for the night. I laid down and put my phone on do not disturb. I was strangely feeling comfortable, like maybe nothing was that wrong after all. But just a few minutes after I turned off my lights, I heard my bedroom door creak open. I opened my eyes, and that's when I saw the man in his underwear, standing in my doorway. I started screaming from the top of my lungs, and that's when the man suddenly lunged towards me. I began to kick and scream simultaneously, just to get the creep away from me. Thankfully, the sounds I was making were enough to make him turn around and run out of the house. My mom came storming into my room to my aid. We stayed in the bedroom with a chair leaning against the doorknob, and immediately called the police. Somewhat unsurprisingly, the man did didn't run very far. They caught him lurking in the neighbor's yard just a few doors down. We handed over the security footage to the police and told them everything we knew. And after a few days of investigating, we got the story they were able to put together. The man who snuck into my room was the same one who had been stalking me at school. He had developed an obsession over me and started taking pictures of me on campus and then eventually started following me home. But the part that terrifies me the most was how he was never a construction worker. Those confusing pictures of wooden planks were just photos he took underneath my bed while I was sleeping in it. He had been sneaking into my house and hiding under my bed for weeks. All I know is that I'll always be on guard whenever a stranger sends me a DM or adds me on Instagram. I'm always paranoid if it's that guy again. Back in my 20s, I used to think very highly of myself. I was a young, slim brunette and would always think I was the main attraction in every room I stepped in. At the time, I lived on the 12th floor of an apartment complex. I can recall always seeing people like my neighbors and other patrons around the building checking me out. I was always being catcalled, but did no more than give them a courteous nod. It took some getting used to, until one night, I got inside and began to situate myself. Then I sat in front of my vanity and started to do my usual skincare routine. You are beautiful, no matter what they say. Cause words can't bring me down. <laughs> <gasps> no! No, 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 no! How dare you say someone will eventually take your place! That'll never happen, you hear me? The next day was like every other day. I would always run errands and have random pedestrians look at me wherever I went. This varied from single men, to taken men, to even married men. However, I had this nagging feeling of dissatisfaction, as I wasn't turning as much heads as I would have liked to. When I arrived home, I immediately glanced at the mirror, angered at my disheveled appearance. Then, as I approached closer to my reflection, I felt as if the answer was right in front of me. I wasn't going to stay young forever, and I was afraid to lose all the beauty I possessed. Possessed. No! No, 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 no! This can't be happening to me! Then, as I scrutinized my face in the mirror, I noticed some wrinkles forming and my face slightly sagging. I panicked, my hands trembling in apprehension. I then grabbed my brush and started frantically combing my hair. As I said, I gotta do it. I must do it. I will do it. 
Then, without a hinge of reluctance, I decided to undergo plastic surgery. The next day, I began seeking consultation from medical pundits, but unfortunately, they all told me the same thing, that I didn't need it and that overdoing it could increase my health risk, resulting in irreversible damage. However, no matter what they say, I constantly refused, hollering, I didn't come here to get rejected. I'm willing to pay you any amount. Just give me what I want. Miss Hannah, it's not just about the money. If we proceed, you might- I don't care. Just get it done. I slammed my fist on the table, frightening <gasps> the doctors. So, unable to persuade me, we inevitably went through with the operation and after grueling hours of sedation, lying flat on the operation table, I finally woke up, my head wrapped in bandages. Upon arriving home, I noticed the watchful eyes of my neighbors, who were probably curious about what had happened to me. Little did they know that, enclosed in this cocoon, was the most beautiful butterfly just waiting to reveal itself. So, as I waited for my face to heal, I was filled with anticipation, visualizing myself stepping on the false representation of beauty that I saw in other women. Just wait and see. After this, I'll be the hottest girl around town. <laughs> <laughs> then, when it eventually came time for the big reveal, I stripped away the bandages like a fascinating creature coming out of its shell, and went out into the streets to display the final stage of my metamorphosis. So, as I entered the grocery store, I earned a couple of stares and compliments, and as expected, some of the guys approached me, asking if I was single or if they could get my number. Needless to say, it was flattering. However, as I went home, I was flustered, feeling my temperature rise again. I still wasn't satisfied with the public's perception of me. I felt as if I wasn't turning enough heads as I would have anticipated, despite my best efforts. Without looking into the mirror, I knew my face was turning red because I could feel the blood coursing through my veins, boiling with agitation. So, releasing my pent-up frustration, I said, No, this can't be happening! My body quivered as I told myself, It's not enough. I need more, 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 more! My yearning for perfection had driven me to undergo more plastic surgeries. Despite the doctor's constant opposition, eventually, I had more work done until I underwent 20 various procedures. At some point, the doctors refused to take me in as their patient, wary of the damage I might cause to their reputation should future operations fail. I loathed such people, successful yet self-centered pricks who always thought they could boss me around. But no, it's unacceptable. I went on a rampage, and eventually, I was escorted out of the hospital and banned from ever returning. Turning. So, when I arrived home, I sat on the front of my vanity and began to cry. <laughs> As tears poured down my face, I laughed like a lunatic, infuriated by the doctors who had the audacity to refuse me. I paced myself apprehensively as I thought of what to do next. At that moment, I was drowning in anxiety, visualizing myself as an invisible woman that people would bump into without ever noticing me. So, without a doubt, I searched the black market, bought what I needed, put my latex gloves on, and did the deed. The following day, I was getting ready to step outside of the house to display a kind of beauty that was unparalleled. That was until someone knocked on my door. Upon opening it, I noticed it was the neighbor from down the hallway. However, instead of coming closer, he had this horrific look on his face, as if he had seen a ghost. Offended, I asked, Why are you looking at me like that? Stupid neighbor. I can't stand beta men like him. <laughs> <laughs> you are beautiful, no matter what they say, cause words can't bring me down. This story was inspired by a 28-year-old woman who was a successful model and singer. Before her descent into plastic surgery addiction, there were multiple doctors that refused to work on her anymore. Before she took matters into her own hands, she then returned to Korea. Her parents could not recognize her. She has since received psychiatric help.
The next story may sound fabricated, but it is quote unquote allegedly true, and has circulated the internet if you do a little digging. It was an urban legend that occurred around 2004-2005 in the city of Cuernavaca in Morelos, Mexico. The following animation portrays a dramatized version of the alleged event. All parties will be given aliases to protect the identities of all involved. There was a story so implausible that I would shake my head and roll my eyes when I ever heard my colleagues talking about it. However, all of this changed when someone in my family experienced the same thing, prodding me to withdraw every ounce of doubt. Three years ago, my brother and his pal had just left a drinking party at a nightclub. They were so wasted it was difficult to even book a cab home. So as they tread across the long paved roads, struggling to avoid passing cars, they saw what appeared to be a brightly lit domicile in the distance. As they approached the light source, they realized that it wasn't a house, but a McDonald's fast food restaurant. They glanced through the glass windows and feasted their eyes on the menu displayed on the counter, delighted to see very few customers. After all, it was past midnight, and not so many people were expected to be out at this hour. Farnished after a long walk, they decided to order some Big Macs and flump on a bench outside the restaurant where a statue of Ronald McDonald was sitting comfortably at the edge. Staring at the statue, they noticed its smile seemingly jolly and its eyes eerily gazing back at them, causing them to feel reluctant before they eventually looked at each other and laughed at the childish thought, brushing it aside. <sighs> a lit night, Pedro. I'll never forget it, my brother said as he took an enormous bite. Dude, you see that thing was giving me a bubble? She was bad, wasn't she? I might have to take her to McDonald's for a first date. <laughs> Pedro winked while patting him on the back. Well, I'm sorry, dude. I can't hold it anymore. The sour taste in my brother's mouth made him wretch. And so, unable to contain it, he headed to the trash bin where he threw up for the next couple of minutes, leaving his friend all alone with the statue on the bench. Having lost the strength and interest to finish his burger, Pedro thought of taking a nap on the Ronald McDonald statue's lap. And as he began to shut his eyes, he grumbled and said, Oh, my headaches have gotten worse. I wish I could just die. Then, a creepy voice replied, Be careful what, what you, you wish for. Ah! Pedro jumped, wondering for a moment where the voice might have emanated from. However, as he listened to cars honking and tree branches falling, he was convinced it was all in his head. See, Pedro? This is what happens when you get drunk. He told himself as he resumed his nap. Then, amidst the silence, Pedro sighed and said, I'm so tired. Moments later, the same voice from before spoke to him and replied, That, that makes, makes the two of us. Before Pedro had any chance to react, the statue grabbed his head with both hands, tightening its vice grip as Pedro wailed in agony. Ah, somebody help me! Even as he begged the clown to stop, it showed no remorse and continued to apply immense pressure on his skull until his entire head was squished to smithereens. When my brother finally returned to his friend, he dropped his burger in utter terror. Then, as he saw Pedro's eyeballs roll across the floor, he screamed. He instantly woke from a semi-stupor, banging on the door of the McDonald's. Somebody help me! Please let me in! However, to my brother's horror, McDonald's had already closed, and no one else was there. So, as he glanced at the bench behind him, the statue was now standing erect with a menacing gaze, showing off its razor-sharp teeth. In a split second, my brother made a run for it into the woods. Although he considered this nothing but mere imagination, the sound of his footsteps quickly catching up to him were all too real. <laughs> what the hell is going on? Moments later, the evil clown grabbed his arm as he tried to break free. That's when the clown rips my brother's arm off, leaving him on the ground as he wailed in sheer agony. Ah! Then, the clown growled as it delighted itself in a sumptuous meal. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no. I'm loving it! I'm loving it! I'm loving it! With his adrenaline rushing, my brother got to his feet, heedless of the immense pain. Then, he ran away from the woods until he eventually arrived home. As he locked the door behind him, he ran to the living room and dialed 911 with his remaining arm. His hand was uncontrollably shaking as he waited for an officer to pick up the call. When he was finally able to speak to someone, my brother said, wincing at the pain of his severed arm. Please send the cops! I know this is hard to believe, but Ronald McDonald is after me, and he's about to kill me! Okay, sir, I'm sorry, but you need to slow down and say it more clearly this time. Do you understand? But I don't have time! Like I said, Ronald McDonald is on his way to kill me! You mean... The clown, sir? The officer asked with a hint of sarcasm and irritation. Yes, ma'am! Please hurry! Sir? Then, suddenly, 
The cop's voice turned from annoyance to delight. You just made my day. To be honest, I was told there was going to be some kind of initiation since this is my first week in the office. So I'm partly sorry for ruining the surprise, but it's a good one, sir. You got me. <laughs> no, 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 no. This isn't a prank, lady. Send someone fast, please. I'm begging you. Well played, sir. Well played. My brother panicked. The officer then hung up on him. Moments later, my brother heard a loud thud on the door, followed by constant banging. Come on, you no fun! Let me in! The clown said in a demonic voice. We can do this the easy way or the hard. Choose wisely! <laughs> As the clown pounded louder, my brother only felt more anxious. Leave me alone or I will call the cops! The cops already hung up on you, dipshit! Now open the door! If you don't open up this very second, I'm gonna release all my Big Mac sauce on your front door! <laughs> Finally, my brother decided to grab a knife from the kitchen and face his pursuer head on. If the cops don't do anything, I will, he told himself, mustering every ounce of courage he had in his body. My brother looked through the peephole as he listened to the clown's incessant laughter. However, strangely enough, he was nowhere to be seen. Despite my brother's reluctance, he opened the door, ready to strike the clown at will. But out of nowhere, the clown quickly wrapped its large hands around my brother's head, squeezing the life out of him. Ah, let go of me, you prick! That's when my brother began to gouge out Ronald's eyes with his remaining hand while being suspended in midair. By some miracle, he managed to dig his fingers deep inside the crevices of the clown's eye sockets and rip his eyeballs out. That's when the clown released my brother from its tight grasp. Ah, I'm not loving it! My brother sprinted while weeping convulsively as he flagged down a moving vehicle to bring him to the nearest hospital. When I heard about my brother's story, my parents and I wanted to report this to the police. The security cameras outside the restaurant recorded the incident. However, McDonald's paid off all the damage expenses, including my family's debts, law enforcement, and all parties involved, coercing us to keep the security tapes confidential. But rumor has it the word got out to the public which caused multiple McDonald's franchises throughout the country to replace their Ronald McDonald benches with ordinary benches. Since then, my brother has been in a coma, almost irresponsive. My entire family avoids all McDonald's restaurants, wary of a clown sitting on a bench. <laughs> I was always told that college would be this super foundational time where you have fun and form critical memories. But five years on it from now, at 27 years old, there's only one memory that sticks out. And unfortunately, it doesn't have anything to do with girls or going out and partying. But instead, something that happened on Omegle. I've always been a loner and a geek my whole life. I didn't successfully come out of my shell in college, although I wanted to. That's why I moved into the dorm rooms near my campus in the first place. I figured it'd be a great way to meet people and socialize, but I ended up getting straddled with huge room and board expenses on top of my tuition debt. I never managed to make any friends in my hall. That's how I caved in and fell back on being a parasocial weirdo through the gateway of the internet, through Omegle more specifically. It's a website that pairs you up with random strangers so you can text or video chat. That's where I spent most of my time trying to meet people in the online world. But in a lot of ways, it was more of the same of what I got in the real world. Most people skipped me almost immediately. A lot of the people that I managed to have conversations with were older men, who seemed insightful at first, but then turned out to be weird and creepy. Then, of course, there was the classic Omegle horde of people without a webcam trying to bait me to give out my ASL. But every once in a while, there was a good conversation to be had with someone who wasn't trying to seduce me. I held out hope to get paired with people like them through dealing with all the BS. One night, after I finished studying, I turned off the lights in my room so people wouldn't see it behind me. Then I hopped onto a Megal to look for a decent person to talk to. That night more than all the others went off to an insane start. The very first stranger I encountered was instantly showing me their bare feet. I could tell it was a man's by the hairy legs and toes too. They were standing on top of their desk with their camera pointed straight at their ingrown toenails. I was frozen by the sight of it. I had no idea what to say to something like that so I didn't say anything. I didn't skip though. I was hoping it would go somewhere entertaining. And I was more than used to seeing exposed ugly people since that sort of thing was oddly common to see on Omegle. After a long awkward silence, I tried to open the conversation. Um, hi. Why there? 
Uh, nice feet. Thanks, I've been told. <laughs> um, can I see your face, sir? Mmm, only if you let me show you my special talent. You have a special talent? Sure, man, bring it on. Splendid! Stay right there! Don't you dare click skip, you got that? Okay. A split second later, the stranger put a watermelon-sized glass jar down the desk between his legs and shouted like he was pretending to be a magician or something. He then said, I call this act, One Man, One Jar. Are you ready to see my contortionism demonstration? Uh, sure. <clears throat> I said... Are you ready to see my contortionism demonstration? Yeah, man, do it! Alright, brace yourself! The man then put both his feet in the jar. Then, he crouched down and stuffed in his legs. I watched in awe as he squeezed his entire body into it, until it was completely inside the jar. His face was visible, but was completely smushed up against the glass, and I could finally see his face. He looked to be some balding middle-aged guy living in a drafty old apartment. Then, with his one free arm, he reached over and grabbed a lid and somehow managed to put it on top of himself, closing the jar with his entire body sealed inside. I couldn't tell if the pressure was distorting his face or if he was just crazy, but he smiled at me very disturbingly, like he was waiting for me to applaud. I didn't have any words. I couldn't comprehend how a grown man had fit himself into something so small. Well, what do you think? I, I, uh, that, that's very cool, but can you get out? Can I get out? Of course I can get out. What? That's when he tried to push the lid off. But as soon as I saw it not move, the man's smile started to slowly vanish from his face. I knew something was wrong. He kept trying to push himself up to get the lid off his back, but he wasn't able to budge it. He was too tightly packed in there to maneuver, and he couldn't get any leverage from the position he was in. All of a sudden, panic was written all over him. His face turned red and puffy, and he frantically tried to move whatever he could, but all of it barely amounted to anything more than rattling his cage. Quickly, it started to seem as though he was having trouble breathing, too. Help me! I can't move, I'm stuck! Oh god, I'm stuck! Help! I don't know what to do! Get me out of here, please! But I don't know where you are! Tell me where you are and I'll call the cops! After the reality had set in that he was completely stuck, the panic had turned into utter despair. He was sobbing incoherently, completely <laughs> incapable of forming words. Tears and snot and drool streaming from his face and down inside the wall of the jar. What is your location? Tell me! I'm in my, I'm in my apartment! Please, please come find me! Please! Come! God, me. What's your address? Please, that's all I need to know and you'll be okay! Yeah! Damn it, man, focus! <gasps> no! No, 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 no! It only took me a second to realize what I had done. I became so panicked and frustrated that I accidentally pressed the skip button when I banged my fist on the table, causing me and the stranger to be disconnected forever. I'll never be able to properly describe that sinking feeling I felt in that moment knowing I had just doomed that man to his unusual fate of slowly suffocating, trapped, alone, unable to move. My hands were shaking uncontrollably. I didn't think there was anything I could do. If I called the police, they wouldn't be able to find him since I never heard his address. I didn't record any of it and there's no way of knowing where somebody is from Omega. Without a better idea, I swore to never go back on there. I tried to forget that I was ever on Omega in the first place. I actually got drunk for the first time that night, in hopes that I could go to bed and sleep without much trouble. But God knows, even after all these years, there's nothing that will get the image of that trapped man in a jar out of my head. It's been haunting me for so long. Every day I wonder what happened to him, if anybody ever came to rescue him, or if those moments he spent with me over the internet were his last moments with anyone. These days, I remember one man, one jar, as a friend. Years ago, I worked at this cheap waxing salon in a rundown part of town. The place was open six days a week from 9am to 9pm, but the only people that ever really worked there were me and the owner herself. She'd come in for the morning and work on the handful of regulars we had, then she would leave me to watch the shop from 3 to close. Since the salon was right on the edge of the ghetto, it isn't hard to imagine that the clientele was sparse at best, especially after dark. I hardly remember getting any customers in all the time I worked there. Mainly, I would just make myself appear busy by cleaning the same things over and over again. 
with more and more attention to detail as the boredom grew. It felt nice in a way for the boss to trust me with a business like that, and I was getting paid by the hour, so it didn't matter to me if I was actually waxing somebody or just sanitizing the beds again even though they weren't in use. All around, it was an alright gig, and if nothing had happened, I probably would have kept working there until it inevitably closed down or laid me off due to lack of business, but of course, I wouldn't have such a crystal clear memory of my last night working there if something hadn't happened. It was just after sunset, and I had another two hours to go on my shift, so I decided to wipe down the whole big window pane from the inside, then the glass part of the front door too. It was pretty dark out, and I knew I was in a sketchy side of town, so I took a good look through the door to make sure nobody was lurking out in front of the shop watching me clean. There was no one in sight, so I felt safe kneeling to wipe down the bottom window pane of the door. I killed a good minute making sure it was spotless, then when I was satisfied, I stood up. That's when she appeared right in front of my face, staring at me right on the other side of the glass. I was so shocked that I screamed and almost jumped into the air. She looked like the most severely anorexic person I've ever seen, like just a sack of skin hanging from a stiff skeleton, and her eyes were so sunken in that it almost made her skull look hollow. For a moment, I thought she was dead, but somehow still standing. But then after we kept staring at each other, her neck started to twitch, tilting her head from side to side, and at at the same time her mouth fell open and she began to make the most awful noise, like growling almost, but something more inhuman. I backed away from the door, wishing I had kept my keys on me in that moment, or better yet that there was a deadbolt I could just throw to keep her locked out, but there wasn't. She wouldn't stop making that sound, staring at me without blinking, without even breathing. I knew I'd been caught off guard, so I tried to collect myself. Excuse me, can I help you? She didn't respond. I was beginning to think she was incapable of speech. Without breaking eye contact with me, she walked into the door, pushing it open with her body like she didn't even notice it. Now, to my horror, she was inside the shop, and she still hadn't taken a breath from that creepy clicking sound that she was making with her throat. Hey, what are you doing here? Can I help you with anything? Hello? When I shouted at her again, she stopped for a second, but all she did was twitch. Do you... Do you know where you are? Is there anyone I could c call for you, ma'am? Then, something in her twitched up subtly. Her eyes drifted away from me and looked off somewhere else. She took another step forward, slowly and rigidly, then walked past me like I wasn't even there. Her aura was so intense and so deeply unnerving that I was frozen stiff until she made her way about six feet away from me again. Finally, I remembered I was on the clock, and I tried to tell myself that this was just one of those weird street people that wandered in sometimes. The only thing back where she was walking was the actual salon, and she definitely wasn't allowed in there. Hey! Hey! You can't go back there! Customers only! Hey! She walked right through an open door into one of the rooms, and that awful sound she made followed her in. By this point, I was really losing my patience with her, but I was still so very disturbed, which is why I kept my distance rather than physically blocking her way in. Still, somebody had to deal with the situation, and it just so happened that it had to be me if I wanted to keep my job. So after a few seconds, I tiptoed up the doorway and cautiously peeked around the corner. The image I'll never forget is that woman having crawled onto one of the beds with her contorted body writhing and thrashing, like she was a demon being exercised. Right as she snapped her neck to look at me, and screaming, Wax me! Wax me! Wax me! That was my breaking point. I sprinted out of the shop and didn't look back until I jumped into my car and hid inside with the doors locked. From there, I immediately called the police and watched through the windshield into the shop to see if she did anything else while I waited for help to arrive. When they finally showed up, it was only two cops in one car. They looked pretty aloof until they saw how shaken I was, then they actually did an investigation. I remained outside while they walked through to go see her, and I watched as they looked all around, then walked back out, shrugging. I couldn't believe them when they said she wasn't in there. I went back in and searched through everything they had just looked at, convinced that she had to be hiding somewhere. 
but she was literally nowhere to be found. I explained that there was no back door exit, and I know without a doubt that I didn't see her leave the way she came in, so somehow, she had to still be in there. The cops looked like they were already done with me, but they asked to see the security footage anyway. Right then, my stomach dropped as I remembered. My cheapskate boss had been putting off fixing the security cameras for over two months, so there was no footage of that night at all. There were cameras in there, but they weren't recording. They were just for show. At that, the cops dismissed everything and left me there, dumbfounded. Of course, I quit on the spot. I didn't want to chance ever seeing her again. It's been about 10 years since that night, and even though most people don't believe me, I always tell this story because of how much it is stuck with me. Honestly, I think that woman was some kind of ghost. It's the only explanation for how she could have appeared and disappeared like that without a trace. I've been living with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder for many years now, and although I take medication for it, the treatment has never been 100% effective. I don't even know what normal is supposed to feel like anymore, but apparently, I'm not, at least. That's what the people in my life keep telling me. The love of my life was the one who threw it in my face the most. We were together for quite some time, and we used to love going out every chance we got, even after I started seeing my psychiatrist. We did it all. Movie dates, dinner dates, hikes through the nature and trips to the beach, the whole romantic ringer. And it was often documented by Instagram selfies and that sort of thing. Anybody who knew us based on our social media would have guessed we were a perfectly happy couple, but the reality was not so rosy. Like any couple, we had our ups and downs, but our lows certainly outweighed our highs. Every single argument we ended up getting into got heated and out of hand, sometimes even devolving into physical altercations. You're not listening to me! Shut up! I'm not talking to you while you're throwing things and screaming at me! I'm not screaming at you! I'm just upset! Over what? I don't even remember anymore. Just, just leave me alone! When things started to blow up, it always ended with her refusing to speak to me and running off into the bedroom and kept me locked out for hours. I hated being <laughs> shut out, but when I eventually cooled off and heard her crying to herself on the floor, I always forgot whatever it was we were fighting about and did what I could to let her know that at the end of the day, all I wanted to do was be there for her. Baby, I'm sorry. Let's not do this again. It was your fault. It's always your fault. I know it was me. I don't understand myself either. I wish I could for you, but you have to believe me. I'm trying. I'm trying. I don't keep trying. Just please let me in. I'll come out in an hour. Just give me some space. I can't even remember how many times that scenario played out, but every time, we swept the issue under the rug and pretended like everything was okay. Neither of us knew how in the world we were supposed to fix each other, so we just didn't. Over time, I tried to figure out ways to compensate for the problems. For instance, when we went out, especially right after a big fight, I was always extra affectionate and touchy. I knew that was her love language or something, so I figured she would appreciate the ample PDA. I thought maybe it was working because it always made her smile. But then I slowly realized that it was a fake smile out of awkwardness. And that was the moment I realized she was thinking about leaving me. That made my blood boil. But I was dead set on not fighting in public anymore. So I kept it bottled up and acted like I couldn't notice her rolling her eyes and making me feel like some clinging psychotic boyfriend. But when other men looked at her, I snapped. All the pent-up anger blew up in the face of whatever stupid schmuck had the balls to look at my girl with some dopey smile. What do you think you're looking at, punk? That's my thing! You better stop staring unless you want a pavement facial, you got that? Stop it! What's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? I'm not the creep who's eyeing something that ain't his! Stop shouting at me! <laughs> you and I need to talk! I knew what that meant. That was what she said when she was about to suggest we take a break from each other. But I always shut the idea down. But one night, when I thought she was going to suggest time apart again, she took it a step further. I can't be in this relationship with you anymore. We need to just be friends. You're breaking up with me? After everything we've been through together, you're really just gonna end it now? Yes! We're toxic! We're not good for each other! No! 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 I can't believe you're doing this to me! You traitor! I pretty much blacked out when she broke up with me. I smashed everything in my house. I broke windows, punched holes in the walls, and ripped the doors off the hinges. And when I came to, the whole place was trashed and my girlfriend was gone. 
The next day I called her up, but she didn't reply. I had to ring her a dozen times before she eventually picked <gasps> up. Baby, I am so sorry about last night. I don't know what came over me. Please, please give me another chance. You ran out of chances a long time ago. I know, I know, but can we meet for one more walk along the trail? We can take pictures on Instagram and just end things properly, you know? <sighs> Fine, but we aren't getting back together. I felt a lot better when I knew I'd at least get to walk through the old nature trail with her one more time. I looked forward to it all day and night, and even got cleaned up a bit just to see her the next day. However, even though we said we were meeting there to talk, we were both pretty quiet. I tried to ease the tension by holding her hand, but she rejected it immediately. From that point on, she acted even more standoffish. We walked a full mile in complete silence. All we did was stop every few hundred feet to take photos of the landscape for Instagram. Except this time, we weren't in the photos together, which definitely stung. By the time we got to the turnaround point of the trail, which was scaled up a hillside and looked over a cliff to the rest of the nature preserve, I was honestly ready to just be done with everything. There was no point in this stupid walk together, and there was no point in even trying to talk to her, let alone try to win her back. The view from the cliff was quite nice that day, and we both made sure to take photos of it. I got one standing next to her by the ledge, but then, while she was engrossed in taking as many photos as possible, I slowly backed up a few steps, got one last picture of her enjoying the view, then ran forward and did the deed. Here's the alleged photograph of the girlfriend. It was the last image shared via her boyfriend's Instagram. I guess you now know the disturbing backstory behind this candid photo. Thinking about this story from my past always reminds me that I wasn't exactly the most stable person in my mid-twenties. I had just gotten out of college with a degree in kinesiotherapy, but after several months of a fruitless search for a job that was actually in my field, I settled for a job in a waxing salon. I only did it because I was out of time and needed to get some kind of income before I went completely broke. But it was a completely dead-end job in the worst part of town. The area was known for robberies and gang activity and generally high crime rates and we saw our fair share of that from the salon. Every time I went into work, the rotating cast of junkies that would constantly linger outside would harass me for money or try to solicit me for a free wax or something, which is a great way to start the day in a good mood. Unsurprisingly, I hated my life before long. For some reason, the salon was wildly popular with the residents of the neighborhood. There was no wonder why it was understaffed. The place always reeked, yet the customers never seemed to mind probably because they didn't notice it over their own stench. They were the most disgusting sort of people that you can imagine having to work on. None of them seemed to care about personal hygiene, which inevitably scared off 90% of the employees. It was like a salon for all the bums, lards, junkies, and lowlives in the hood to hang out at. I stuck it out for a few months though, and the longer I was there, the more I hated myself and everyone around me. Things came to a boiling point around the beginning of February, that time of the year right before Valentine's Day when everybody wants to get a wax. It made the salon ridiculously busy, and since I was the newest hire, I got stuck with most of the work. For days on end, I didn't get a moment to breathe between clients, yet I still ended up behind and having to stay late with no overtime pay while my boss hid in her office. Every time they screwed me over, I got closer and closer to a full-on mental breakdown, but I was doing everything in my power to keep it together. But then, one day, just a few days before Valentine's Day, it was time to call up an appointment for a man named Homer. Homer, we're ready for you. At first, there was no response, and for a moment I thought they hadn't shown up and I might just get ahead of schedule, but of course that wasn't the case. The largest, hairiest man I've ever seen walked in and smiled at me, spiking my blood pressure even higher than it already was. I knew it would easily take me the rest of my shift just to wax this guy depending on what he asked for, and I was too busy to deal with that. Unfortunately, I had no choice. What kind of wax will you be having today, sir? A full body wax, please. Are you sure? Did I stutter? Did I say I wanted a Brazilian wax? Did I request a BBL? Yes, I'm sure! Now put some pep in your step, little lady. I don't have all day. Okay then, right this way, sir. I kept my cool and let him into the salon room in the back. There, I gave him the usual speech about undressing and getting comfortable, where I was very glad that he left his underwear on. I didn't waste any time getting to work. As soon as he lay down on the table, I smeared the liquid wax on his thick matted body hair, placed the tape over top of it, then let it rip. 
I cracked a little smile at how quickly he went from a big tough guy to a screaming little baby, but I didn't let him see it. I also, of course, didn't slow down. I'm sorry, sir, but that was just one out of a thousand. You've still got 999 more to go. What? 998? Ah, no can do, mister. I've got a lot of work to do and I'm not going to spend one more minute than I have to with you. Yeah, screw you! What was that? Ah, I'm sorry. Just hold on, please. Something's not right. Oh, so you think you can tell me how to do my job, is that right? No, 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 no. no. Something just doesn't feel right. Why don't you just let the professional handle their business? No! Is <laughs> there a less painful way to do this? Nope. You're the one who signed up for a full body wax, remember? <laughs> I poured all my pent up frustration into ripping out that guy's body hair. Honestly, I don't think I ever worked faster. Something about the pain I was inflicting upon him was extremely motivating, even cathartic. By the time I was halfway through, the big man was sobbing like a lost child. But no matter how much he whimpered and screamed and begged me to stop, I told him to suck it up and kept going. Actually, his crying made me laugh. The more pathetic he became, the funnier I found the whole situation. I don't think I ever enjoyed a single day at that job, but I did enjoy working at home. About 45 minutes later, we were done. I cleaned the pile of discarded tape and left Homer in the room to get dressed while I went out to the waiting room to call up my next client. However, right as I walked out the door, my boss was there in my face, glaring at me like I just killed somebody. She looked behind me and saw Homer writhing around on the table, looking like a shriveled up hairless chihuahua. She started freaking out and began apologizing profusely, offering him some sort of compensation before finally escorting him out the door. After he limped away, she went back into the room and rummaged through my setup to see why the appointment turned out that way. And that's when she came to me with a huge bottle of Gorilla Glue, asking me if I had used it on Homer. The funny thing is, I don't remember bringing that into work, but when I think about it, it makes sense. I must have been in a really bad mood and thought it would be a good idea, but apparently waxing somebody with industrial grade adhesive was not humane. They fired me that day, which I wasn't really pressed about. My life, my career, my mental stability have gotten much better now that I'm rid of that place. But I'm still surprised Homer never sued us. I'm just glad he never decided to press charges against me either. As I look back and reflect on that incident, I always wonder what became of it and if he ever recovered from the damages. But the one thing I'll never know is if he ever got some for Valentine's Day. When I was in college, I was a heavy party. I would go to just about every house party I heard about. And I got to know a lot of people in that crowd. Or at least I think I did. I wasn't one of those jocks or anything. I was just one of those people that liked to drink a lot and have better memories of the beginnings of parties than I do the middle or end. I usually went by myself, hoping to meet people there. But a lot of the time, the only thing I got to know was the bottom of the bottle. One night, my drinking habit almost got me into serious trouble. I was at this guy named Larry's house. He was a bit of a geek. But somehow he had the privilege of having this huge house right off campus that was perfect for partying. This particular night was the third or fourth time I'd gone to a party at Larry's. They were always a blast. It was packed every time. And that night was even crazier. It was a New Year's party. Everybody was there. Starting from the football team, the jocks, the cheerleaders, the frat boys, all the sorority girls, plus the clout chasers like me, and just about every kind of person you can imagine. There was a hot tub and a pool. And the most fun thing to do was to climb on the roof and jump into the pool with a cannonball or something. But nobody was allowed to jump from the second floor balcony. That was Larry's one forbidden rule. No matter how packed it got, nobody was ever allowed to go upstairs. Of course, that drew everyone's attention to the unlit staircase around the corner. But nobody dared to break the rule. Larry might have been a nerd, but he was the man in charge of the house. And he had some respect for that. Nobody wanted to be banned from Larry's parties. And neither did I, of course. But unfortunately, I went a little too hard at the New Year's party. I pre-drank by downing a couple beers before I got there. I then grabbed one within the first minute. Then I had another, then another, and another. By the time it was getting close to the New Year, it was on like 8 or 10. The whole house was spinning. And from what I heard about my behavior from others later on, I was pretty belligerent. I was about 5 minutes from passing out when I crashed on the living room couch and wouldn't move. 
At the time of the night, I could hear all the commotion of people hurrying outside to light fireworks at midnight. I wanted to go out there too, but I knew that amount of movement just wasn't in me. I was the last person in the house and Larry was hovering over me, trying to get me to go. Hey man, get up. You're gonna miss the fireworks. Nah man, I'm good. Just, just leave me here, I'll be alright. Really man? You're gonna sleep on the New Year's? Dude, I am lit as hell. I am not moving. But you're gonna get sick on my couch, aren't you? Come on and throw up outside if you're gonna yak. Hey man, I can hold my liquor. I ain't never thrown up in anybody's house. Just ask anybody, alright? I, I just need a nap, okay? So just let me be and let me lay down. <sighs> alright man, listen to me. You better not go upstairs. You hear me? Yeah, yeah, man. Whatever. Alright, just come outside if you're feeling better. Larry finally left me alone and went out to the backyard. Then, I was alone at about half an inch from blacking out completely. The only thing that kept me conscious was what Larry had just said. What he was always saying about the upstairs. The stairwell was staring right at me, making me wonder why in the world he was so serious about that over all other things. Larry never cared if somebody shattered a $500 vase in their drunkenness. But it was like we all lived in fear of what would happen if somebody went upstairs. The curiosity was killing me, despite being hammered out of my mind. At some point, I heard somebody call out that it was just five minutes before midnight. Fireworks were already being set off prematurely, so I felt like there was no better time than that. Despite being unable to even walk, I slid off the couch and crawled on the floor to the stairwell. Then I dragged myself up the steps. I had to stop a few times just to clench my stomach so I wouldn't yak right on the stairs. But I made it up eventually. The landing came out to a long empty hallway that was pitch black. I made out four doors along the wall. I crawled along the floor to the first one and reached up to open it. Then I peeked inside. Nothing. Just a normal bedroom. Although it didn't look like anyone actually lived in it. I shut the door and made my way over to the next one. Same thing, just a normal room, except this one was an office. The third room wasn't special either. It was just a completely empty space. All that was left was the fourth door at the far end of the hallway. Whatever the secret was, I thought, it had to be behind that door. I was running out of steam, but I made one last push. As I got close to the door, I heard muffled screaming from outside growing louder and louder. I then realized they were just counting down from 10. By then, I already had my hand on the door now, but I made it a point in my delirium to wait until the stroke of midnight to try to open the door. I turned the doorknob, but it was locked. Damn it, it's locked. Then, in that exact moment, Larry body slammed me against the door. It was like he came out of nowhere, but by the time I realized what was happening, he was already putting me in some kind of stranglehold. You stupid little snake. Do you have any idea what I'm going to do to you? Hey, Scott, where you at? You good? Can't have you puking on someone's couch again. If there hadn't been that friend of a friend downstairs looking at me, I'm sure I would have died right then and there. Thankfully, when Larry heard them calling my name, he let me go. Get the hell out of my house. Don't you even think about coming back unless you have a death wish, you hear me? He said this as he shoved me back towards the other end of the hallway. The adrenaline from the situation sobered me up just enough to stand and stumble down the hall. But as soon as I got to the stairs, I slipped on the first step and fell down the entire staircase. Whoa, you okay, you okay man? man? You need, you need someone, someone to call an call ambulance? The ambulance? There was a horrible commotion when everybody saw me hit the floor. The impact was just about the last thing I remember. That friend that saved me ended up calling an Uber and getting me home. Ever since then, I've had to avoid Larry. I always got weird looks from him at school. But I guess I'm better off. I'm not partying anymore. As an Instagram model, I'm quite used to seeing thousands of creepy comments from thirsty drooling dudes on my posts, especially the ones with my more seductive pictures. When I started out, they never bothered me. It wasn't so different from the pathetic advances I was used to getting in person. And after all, those desperate men were the main source of my income as a model. When you become an adult at a time like this, you have to make sacrifices to get by. But my parents were always judging me for it. They said they were just concerned, but I know how they really felt. The last thing I wanted to do was to be the kind of people they are. I was just waiting until I saved enough money to move out of their house and get away from their corporate attitudes. And I was going to take my dog with me. Her name was Carly and she was like my sister. 
She was always the sweetest dog, but for some reason, my parents started to hate her. She seemed like she had developed some kind of anxiety disorder. Every night after my parents went to bed, she would start barking and just wouldn't stop. She had a big voice on her too and would bark constantly all throughout the night until her poor little voice was hoarse the next morning. I did my best to comfort her, but no matter what I did, she wouldn't quiet down. My parents got fed up and started leaving her in the backyard every night. Of course, this only made Carly more anxious, but at least they didn't have to hear it so much. I had trouble sleeping without Carly. She used to sleep with me in my bed, but when all that started, I would lay out on the couch in the living room until I passed out, scrolling through my Instagram out of boredom. One night, I got so bored I went digging through my DMs. Of course, I almost never looked in there because it was almost 100% advances from creepy dudes. And sure enough, there must have been thousands of those messages. I never interacted with any of them because all of my good followers knew that if they wanted to talk to me, they had to subscribe to my OnlyFans. But one night, a particular account caught my eye. I'd seen him so much that I barely even noticed him anymore. But when I looked, I realized he had left a shockingly desperate comment, sometimes even multiple comments, on every single one of my posts. Not only that, but he had sent me a DM literally every single day. And every message was the same. Just him begging to be with me and asking for freebies, along with the same boomer selfie every day. I couldn't resist looking at his account. He was a 40-something year old dude named Charlie with a big fat double chin and a chubby face. He was following over 2,000 accounts, most of which were bots or other models, but he had exactly zero followers himself, probably because he didn't post anything except hundreds of pictures of his face in the same pose in the same dark background which looked like his basement. I knew it was probably a bad idea, but for some stupid reason, I texted him back thinking he was too digitally stupid to find my OnlyFans. Hey there, Charlie. I know you want to chat and see more of me, but I don't do any of that on Instagram. If you click the link in my bio, you can subscribe and get everything you want, including private chats with me and exclusive naughty photos and videos. I didn't even have time to tap out of the chat before he replied. Oh my god, I can't believe it! You replied! I'm so happy right now! Thank you, thank you, thank you so much! You have no idea how much this means to me. You're the most awesome person I've ever talked to! Um, thanks. I couldn't think of anything else to answer with. I was off-put by the fact that he replied to my message so quickly, as if he'd been obsessively waiting by the phone for me. I was already regretting the decision. You're so very, very welcome. Would you like to video chat? I'd really like to see your face. My stomach quivered. Video calling this guy was the last thing I wanted to do. I was literally in my pajamas with no makeup on and my hair looking a mess. Plus, I didn't want to show face to this creep anyway. I put my phone down and tried to distract myself with some TV, but I couldn't ignore it. Between Carly barking herself silly and my phone buzzing constantly from all of Charlie's messages, I couldn't relax at all. And eventually, my curiosity got too intense. I had to see what he was saying. Why are you leaving me on red? Along with a dozen manic messages, he'd sent me another selfie. But this time he was shirtless, revealing his chubby middle-aged body. And he was also crying. I decided I'd had enough of him and muted him on Instagram. I turned up the volume of the TV and did my best to put the whole thing out of my mind. Unfortunately, I really wanted to know if he'd gotten the hint. After a little while, I decided to check one more time. He'd sent a bunch more pictures, all of him with his face getting twisted and red with anger like a fussy toddler. That, and quite a few disrespectful texts. Stop ducking me, stupid thought! Don't ignore me, you tramp! When I read all that nasty stuff, I got heated. I couldn't resist giving him a piece of my mind. Admittedly, I didn't feel any better after I sent that message. More like I'd made some sort of childish mistake. I paused the TV and tried to figure out what I should do next. I could hardly focus on anything, though. For some reason, everything was eerily quiet. That's when I got the last selfie from Charlie. He was in Carly's doghouse, crouching right over her with his arm around her face, trying to break free from his grip. I rushed to my feet and ran out into the backyard, straight for Carly. I found her in the doghouse, decapitated. She was in two pieces in a pool of her own blood, and Charlie's footprints were all over the place. Ever since then, my life has never been the same. How can I go back to normal when I know that psycho was creeping into my backyard at the end? And to think poor Carly was just trying to warn us the whole time, but we didn't listen. I don't even trust my parents anymore. I live with some friends now. I've shaved my head and I never wear makeup anymore. I never even wear more than baggy sweatpants and oversized shirts wherever I go. 
It's all in the hope that if he doesn't find me attractive anymore, he'll leave me alone. I don't think I'll ever believe it though. I deleted all my social media accounts, but as far as I can tell, so did Charlie, which means I was never even able to report him. All the police have is his shoe size, but until they find him, I can never rest knowing he's still out there. Till this day, I still have nightmarish memories of something that I saw on Omegle in the winter of 2016. I was a sophomore in college at the time, but I was still living at home with my parents and not on campus. That year in particular, I was stuck inside for all of winter break because we were experiencing one of the worst snowstorms the area had seen in years. Since the conditions were too unsafe to go anywhere, I spent most of my time studying for online courses. My schedule was loaded with so many classes, which wasn't the best for my ability to develop social skills or make friends on top of everything else. And and, like most guys, the thing I looked forward to most about going to college was meeting girls, but I wasn't getting to do any of that. So, when I heard about this thing called Omegle, a website where you could randomly meet strangers, I was desperate enough to be very interested. I understood from the person who told me about it that it could be a little weird, so I waited for my parents to go to bed before trying it. My laptop for school was super cheap and didn't have a webcam, which meant if I actually wanted to talk to people I had to use my parents shared desktop computer in the family room. I didn't want them or anyone else in my family walking in on me talking to girls, so I decided to wait it out. Around 2 in the morning, I finally snuck out of my room and hopped on the computer to try my luck. To my disappointment, the first 20 or so people that I encountered were all just weird-looking dudes. A lot of creepy old men who I skipped right over, shirtless <laughs> jocks who just wanted to talk about sports, and some geeky shut-ins like me who I skipped even though we might actually have a lot in common. I was on a one-track mind to use Omegle to meet girls. Unfortunately, the first few girls that I did get connected with skipped right over me when they saw that I was just another one of those geeky shut-in types. Admittedly, that stung every time. The endless skipping went on for 20 minutes before I finally got connected with a girl who didn't immediately reject me. I felt a little pit in my stomach form when she popped up on the screen, but it wasn't because I was nervous, but because she looked really sad about something. She was just a normal looking blonde girl wearing a tank top, and like most other people on Omegle, sitting in complete darkness, except for the light coming off her computer screen. She was a bit hunched over with her hands, supporting her on the desk right next to the keyboard. She wasn't necessarily the best looking girl, but I definitely wasn't about to skip her. She was the only girl that had even given me the time of day the whole time I'd been on. And even if I only got to see her upper body, that was going to be more action than I'd get anywhere else. I actually was a little bit nervous though, because the first thing I did was awkwardly wave. Hi there. She waved back, but she didn't say anything. She still had that super sad, kind of weird look on her face. It seemed like she didn't want to talk out loud, so I tried introducing myself in the chat box instead. Hey, I'm Justin. What's your name? When I looked up from the keyboard, I was <gasps> caught off guard by how close the girl suddenly was to the camera. Her eyes were wide open too, like she was making a surprised face, except her mouth was still closed. Whoa, hey, is everything okay? Then, without breaking eye contact, she started typing so frantically and loudly that I could hear it over the microphone. The whole time, she just stared into the camera with these huge bug eyes, not even blinking, just typing away at a robotic speed. All I could see in the chat box was the stranger's typing message for the longest time, until she finally hit the send button and dumped the entire message on me at once. I was put a little on edge when I read it because all it said was, Can you please cry with me? over and over and over again. I didn't know what else to do, so I quickly replied back with a yes in the chat and as soon as she read it, she began to cry. <laughs> 
Then, I actually tried to make myself form tears for her. It was super uncomfortable though. I couldn't bring myself to do it no matter how hard I tried to squeeze my eyes for just one single tear. But she kept getting closer and closer to the camera, until all I could see was a close-up of the snot coming out of her nostrils, oozing down her face with all of the tears from her eyes, pouring over her mouth, which for some reason she kept shut tight, despite having to blow snot out of her nose just so she could breathe. I really thought she must have been going through something really tough. So tough, I felt like she shouldn't cry alone if she didn't want to. And since I couldn't cry with tears, I started fake sobbing and wailing a little bit, but quietly, so I wouldn't wake up anybody in my house. I felt embarrassed, like she could tell it was all fake. After a while, I couldn't take the awkwardness anymore, so I pretended to wipe tears from my eyes and typed another message. Hey, are you okay over there? Why haven't you said anything? Do you want to talk about why you're crying? Suddenly, it was like she flipped a switch and wasn't sad anymore, but excited. She stopped crying, but didn't bother to wipe anything off her face. With a bit of a smile, she started to type again, not looking at the keyboard. A few seconds later, she sent a message that read, Do you want to know why I had my mouth closed this entire time? I was almost too scared to say yes, but I really did want to know. So I typed, Yes, why? That's when I saw her read the message then look into the camera. For a moment, we stared at each other in silence. Then, the little smile on her face got bigger, as if she was holding herself back from laughing. But before she couldn't hold it any longer and finally opened her mouth, a swarm of bugs began to crawl out of it, covering her entire face. Ah! Ah! I screamed from the top of my lungs, immediately shutting the screen off and holding down the power button on the computer until it was completely turned off. My parents were awoken and upset that I was on the computer at this time of night. All I could do was attribute the shouting to some random jump scare video I watched on the internet. But since then, I acted like what I saw that night never happened and never thought about going on Omegle again. I used to browse through magazines and realize how average looking I truly was. I've always wanted to be someone whose beauty would captivate every man that passes by. But no matter what I did, I was always this skinny, ordinary girl to everyone. As the years passed, the sensation persisted like a niche that wouldn't go away. I became increasingly dissatisfied with myself and wanted to look like my hot idol Angelina Jolie. At the time, she was the primary standard when it came to looks and i do anything to obtain that fountain of beauty. As a result, I received consultation from multiple doctors, all of whom became the bearer of bad news. They said I didn't need it, and tried convincing me to reconsider my choices. But at the end of the day, it didn't matter. I was going to get what I wanted, and I wasn't going to let some silly doctor tell me otherwise. So one day, I decided to vent my frustration to a friend saying, I'd do the operation myself if I could, but I'm no damn doctor. My friend then peered over our shoulders to make sure no one was listening and whispered, I've got a better idea. Have you ever tried looking into the black market? The black market? No, I haven't. I know someone there. I'm sure you'd love him. See my lips? He's an expert in this kind of stuff. You should give him a try. In my head, there was no time for doubts. All I needed was to take action, and my dream would finally come true. After further discussion, I learned that the doctor had conducted numerous operations on various clients, who in the end, were happy and content. He had done everything from facelifts to BBLs, the whole nine yards, and the best part was that he rendered his services at an affordable price, much lower than what professionals would charge. I was adamant about looking exactly like Angelina Jolie, so later that day, I picked up the phone and called the doctor. Hello. Hi. Um, are you the doctor that specializes in plastic surgery? Yes, how may I help you, madam? My friend told me you did a great job on her lips. Her name is Isabel. Do you remember her? It took a while for the doctor to reply, but he eventually said, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, I don't recall an Isabel. Perhaps it's because I have too many patients. Well, my name is Sarah, and I'd like to schedule an appointment with you and explain my specifications. Of course, dear. It would be my pleasure. The sooner we meet, the better. Let me give you my address. He replied in a tone that sounded reassuring. Moments later, I was in an Uber, and upon reaching my destination, a huge old house stood before me. I began to be clouded with second thoughts. However, 
Despite being reluctant, I took a deep breath and walked up the steps until I reached the front door. I then gingerly gave the front door a knock. Upon knock, a large decrepit man with a huge grin on his face opened the door. He wore a lab coat and had the doctor attire going on, with a stethoscope around his neck and everything. He then said, Well, hello. We meet at last. Come inside. I certainly wasn't expecting him to look as creepy as he did. His eyes were bulging out and his skin looked pale like the texture of a dried plum. But as we all know, looks can be deceiving, and it would be inappropriate to judge his skills based on his physical appearance alone. I stepped inside, where he led me through a dark, narrow hallway. I sat on top of the operating table as he began to gather more details before the surgery. So, Miss Sarah, how can I help you today? I... I would like my face to look like Angelina Jolie. How splendid! I have all the necessary tools and chemicals to conduct the operation. Shall we get started? I was contemplating backing out, but I had been rejected too many times at this point, so it was literally now or never. And so, after further consultation, I told him exactly what I wanted. I could tell he was listening to every word I said, because once in a while, he would inquire and clarify specific points while taking down notes, ensuring he didn't leave out anything significant. I then put a payment down in cash, followed by an NDA contract which he made me sign before we began the procedure. As I sat there, mentally preparing myself for this moment, the doctor shoved a cloth over my face. <laughs> the next few moments were a complete blur. My vision was hazy and distorted by whatever the hell was on that cloth. I remember vague moments of seeing a heart monitor, amniotic fluid on the side, and a mask covering my face. Then, I could see him hovering over me saying, Don't worry, when you wake up, you will look exactly like Angelina Jolie, my darling. Now go to sleep. <laughs> then I was out. My fate was now in the hands of the man who would change my life forever. Several hours later, I woke up in a wheelchair. My vision was still blurry and I became more aware of my surroundings. I was now in his living room. I began to feel severe pain while remaining completely immobile due to the effects of the chemicals in my body. I raised my hand and tried to touch my face, but it was completely wrapped in bandages. I then began to panic. However, as I squirmed in the chair, the doctor approached me and said, Don't move now. Stay very still. Just take a deep breath and relax. I looked him in the eyes and did exactly as he instructed. Then, moments later, he took the same cloth from earlier and shoved it on my face, causing me to doze off again. When I woke up, I was sitting in the passenger seat of his car, parked outside of my house. He then told me to remove the bandages after 12 hours and to kindly exit the vehicle. Despite feeling sluggish, I thanked him and went inside my house. I was relieved that it was over and ecstatic that I finally got it done. Then, at exactly 12 hours, I took off the bandages, keeping my eyes closed as I anticipated the big reveal. But once I removed the bandages, my face looked like it had been ran over. I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I touched my face thoroughly, unable to comprehend what I was seeing in the mirror. It wasn't anywhere close to becoming the next Angelina Jolie. I was a freaking zombie! <coughs> Since then, I have been living daily looking like a corpse bride lookalike. Regretting that I wanted more when I could have been satisfied with what I had. However, traumatized by the incident, I decided to veer away from plastic surgery, fearing that I would lose more than I already had. The story was inspired by an image of a woman from Iran who got plastic surgery to look like the one and only Angelina Jolie. Her decision to drastically alter her appearance has made her quite the viral sensation. We like to think her doctor was perhaps a fan of Tim Burton. Around the year 2013, me and an old colleague from college, who we'll call Lisa, decided to open up our own business. We opened up a wax salon to be exact, and leased a location by a plaza about 15 minutes away from my place. Like any business at the beginning, we had to start from scratch. So we had a small place with a lobby area, a front desk, and a washroom and wax room on the first and second floors. I was initially anxious, afraid we had to wait until customers poured in. However, my business partner and I were pleasantly surprised by the decent amount of customers we'd been receiving. Pumped up, we provided all kinds of services, from Brazilian wax and full body wax to 
eyebrows and the whole nine yards. The customers <laughs> loved every one of them. And speaking of customers, we had all sorts of people coming in, from typical jock females from a nearby college and women with plans to go out on a date to flat out hairy people. One of the best parts of the job was the screaming. I don't mean to sound like a sadist, but I found it amusing that people would have the courage to undergo such pain to remove all that unwanted hair. In any case, this was the norm, and with money constantly pouring in, I didn't care what kind of clients we had. But things got weird as time went on. As reliable as Lisa had been for the past couple of months, she began developing bizarre habits. For instance, one day Lisa carried a plastic bag with thick red liquid oozing out. Moments later, she revealed the contents, and I found out that they were the liver and spleen of a cow. But that wasn't the strangest part. If you want to know what gave me the creeps, it was seeing her consume them right before me. There was something just so unsettling about watching someone consume raw, juicy innards. Although I found it odd and undesirable, I assumed it was a cultural thing and decided to be polite. However, I must admit that I lost my appetite after watching her eat. What's the matter? Ain't hungry? Lisa asked as she drew a delightful grin. Well, I had a lot to eat this morning. I reluctantly replied as I patted my belly. That's too bad. And she returned to her sumptuous meal like a rabid animal. I'd never seen her like this before, so I didn't know how to react. Then, another time, Lisa called in sick, grumbling about something over the phone which I couldn't understand. <coughs> She kept lashing out at me with tons of gibberish, so I didn't know how to respond to her. Eventually, I'd tell her to rest and end the call, a tad worried and confused, but it became more and more frequent as time passed, so I couldn't help but feel uneasy. When Lisa came back to work again, she'd sincerely apologized, reverting to her usual self. It convinced me that her odd behavior over the phone was just a sign of discomfort, and whenever she recuperated, we'd be able to converse like normal people again. However, while doing Doing some paperwork one day, my finger bled a little, and my instinct to sanitize it before applying adhesive bandages kicked in. Then suddenly, out of the blue, Lisa rushed towards me, grabbed my hand, and licked the wound like some creep. Hey, what the hell do you think you're doing? I hollered, disgusted and afraid. Well, I think we ran out of bandages, so I did what I could to help. She grinned. So I held my hand and told her I was fine. Then, I forced a smile to let her think I was telling the truth. One night, as we worked on the last batch of customers, I finished up early and went to check on one of them. Ah! Ah! Suddenly, I heard an unusual hollering from the room at the far end. It's easy to assume that there wasn't anything unusual with it. However, this was different. It was incessant and desperate, which sent chills down my spine. Something was off, and I was downright horrified. So, I had to creep cautiously and silently as I approached the source of the scream. Then, gently, I opened the door and sneaked downstairs. But as I came closer, I heard gargling and moaning sounds, which I had never heard from any of our customers before. I slowly made my way towards the wax room and began to quietly open the door. When suddenly, Lisa came barging from behind me, slamming the door shut. Unable to stop my body from trembling, I could see Lisa's mouth completely covered in blood, looking at me with a sadistic stare in her eyes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to barge in. I immediately dashed towards the stairs, hoping she wouldn't follow me. Then, I sat by the front desk, unable to decide whether to call the cops or get the hell out of there. I was so nervous that I bit my nails, constantly sweating as I curled up into a coil. Moments later, Lisa came upstairs, reaching for my hand, as she apologized about the ordeal that just took place. Sorry about what just happened. I just had a late lunch. She said, insinuating that she had a bite of cow's liver, which gave her that frightening appearance. Desperately trying to conceal my fear, I smiled and played along. Moments later, she asked me to leave early, insisting she'd stay behind to clean up and close the shop. Without thinking twice, I grabbed my purse and ran the hell out of there. Eventually, I called Lisa and told her I wanted to lease out the building and never see her again. Wait, what? I don't understand. We're not doing so well! 
I could tell she was confused and hurt by the tone of her voice on the phone. I had to tell her several times that I had made up my mind and wasn't willing to compromise. She eventually caved in, and that was the last time we spoke. As the months passed, she became a stranger to me. Unfortunately, I never knew whatever became of that customer, but sometimes I'd wonder what could have happened if this business had continued. Would she have consumed me eventually? I shook my head, hoping I'd never see her again. The next story is an urban legend inspired by the notorious Ronald McDonald, and of course the popular Big Mac from McDonald's. We wanted to animate the origin story of what caused the Big Mac to be what it is today. Seeing as traditional hamburgers all look generally the same with the Big Mac being the exception, here's a disturbing animation for all the Nightmare Fuel fans out there. Just know that we definitely emphasize the big in Big Mac. Have you ever wondered why the classic Big Mac always had two patties in it? Maybe it's to stand out from the competition. I beg to differ, since hearing about the most uncoveted secret that they've been keeping confidential for all these years. For those that hear my story, don't say you heard it from me. This story happened to a friend of a friend of mine. We'll call one of the guys Harold and his fellow acquaintance Kumar for the sake of the story. Apparently, it all started when the pair were at Harold's house, watching TV and getting under the influence. I don't know what their choice of beverage or whatever was, but it sure did give them bloodshot eyes. After about a dozen sitcoms, both of them suddenly looked at each other dead in the eyes and shouted in unison, I got the munchies! You got any food? Come on, man, I know your mom probably hooks you up with leftovers from a restaurant. My mom works at a massage parlor, you idiot! Sheesh, well, I could use a happy ending, too. <laughs> the pair both head to the kitchen to check if there was any food remaining in the fridge. But to their dismay, there was nothing but an expired loaf of bread with mold growing on it. Kumar then suggests that they order some takeout. Harold immediately shuts down Kumar's request, attributing his reasons to being broke and not owning a single dime to his name since his last retail job. They both then mutually decide to go for a midnight stroll and find the nearest fast food venue to relieve them of their munchies. Dude, look, there's a McDonald's down there. I think we should hit it up. Do we have a choice? There isn't a White Castle or any other restaurants open, Mr. Harry Nuts. As they approach the McDonald's, they encounter something bizarre in front of the parking lot. There lied an enormous piece of round bread with a huge slice of cheese on top of it. The pair stood there dumbfounded. Why would the staff leave such a large piece of bread in front of the restaurant like that? And how did such a food exist in a dimension that size? Nonetheless, Harold brushes the notion off as some silly promotion for an upcoming hamburger of McDonald's. As the two head over to the front, they notice that the restaurant was closed, and the only way they were going to get food was at the drive-thru. That's when Kumar storms off towards the drive-thru menu, scanning it like a hungry dog hoping to get an end to his munchies. When the pair finally came to a consensus on what they wanted to order, they approached the drive through window and found a large bundle of red cotton protruding from the inside. Dude, am I tripping or are you seeing what I'm seeing? Looks like strawberry cotton candy. Okay, well I ain't eating that. It probably has debris and bird crap in it. Out of nowhere, the red cotton yanked through the window and into the restaurant. The two glanced through the window, trying to find any staff that might have been lurking inside. I'm not loving it! Ah! Dude, I think I'm hallucinating! Is that... are you...? That's when a giant face of Ronald McDonald appeared from inside the drive through window. The pair couldn't comprehend if they were faced with a behemoth in the flesh, or if this was just a figment of their under-the-influence stupor. The clown then makes it clear that he wasn't pleased with Kumar's remark, saying, Don't ever talk bad about my luscious hair like that, you little rodent! You wish you could have an afro like this! Now may I please take your order? Dude, this is some kind of robot. Like those animatronics at Chuck E. Cheese. I I'll get a hamburger, sir. Yeah, I'll get a hamburger too. Would you both like to be a part of the grand promotion of the Big Mac? It's our new McDonald's hamburger. <laughs> uh, sure, dude. As long as we get our food ASAP. We got the munchies. Indeed. <laughs> and how would you like to pay, sir? I'll take care of it, dude. Credit card, please. Well, unfortunately, there's no ATM around here. So you'll have to pay inside! <laughs> the clown then extends both his arms to the window and grabs hold of Kumar, yanking him inside. Ah! What the hell is going on? Harold tried prying the window open with his bare hands, but it was locked from the inside. 
He then tried opening the front door, but it wouldn't budge. In a fit of hunger and rage, Harold heads back to the drive through window and begins slamming his fists against the glass while yelling, Open the door! I'll make sure McDonald's fires you, you stupid clown! Suddenly, <gasps> something catches Harold's eyes that made him run towards the McDonald's pole and climb in an instant. Ronald McDonald climbs out the drive through window, revealing himself to be a giant, a modern David versus Goliath. Harold held on for dear life, staring up at the eyes of the Leviathan. The clown then pinches the pole and begins to shake it around while Harold screams for dear life. Ah! Leave me alone, I'm going to God! I bet you used to taking it on a pole! <laughs> the clown then grabs Harold and tosses him toward the front of the restaurant, landing on the enormous bread topped with cheese. That's when the giant began to maniacally assemble the so-called Big Mac, suffocating Harold with another piece of bread. He then topped it off with a few condiments, then with Kumar, and then, finally, the crown to top it all off. This marks my territory! The world will now know what the Big Mac is! We shall rule all fast food chains and restaurants! <laughs> I'm loving it! I'm loving it! I'm loving it! I used to frequent this gym a lot towards the end of last year. I needed my body to be in the right condition for the big year I was planning on having, and I wanted to be ahead of the curve. So instead of waiting until January, I got the jump on the New Year's resolutions and started working out around the end of November. I hadn't gone to the gym in a while, but I knew how it usually went with the guys there. I don't like getting catcalled and stared at constantly, so I would always work out late at night. However, there was one guy who I didn't mind too much when he catcalled me. I know that's a bad thing to admit, but I like him. He wasn't the definition of handsome to most people, but to me, he was the sort of guy that I found attractive for some reason. We said hi to each other every night, as we were both consistently going around the same time. Eventually, as our conversations grew, we ended up working out together. One thing led to another, and suddenly, I was going on dates with him and bringing him home to my parents. My parents and friends all said the same thing, that he looked like some kind of Frankenstein. At the time, I acted super offended on his behalf. Half. I always thought he was different from the other guys I dated in the past. For instance, he used to do this thing every time we were together where he'd tell me to hold out my ring finger, then he'd grab it really tight and say, together forever, in that really deep voice of his. Of course I would respond back with, together forever, and he'd let go. When it came close to New Year's, he invited me over to his house for a dinner party to meet his family. It seemed important to him, so I agreed. Unfortunately, when I got there, the romantic fantasy I was deluding myself with started to fall apart. I knocked on the door and my boyfriend answered, bringing me inside. The first thing I noticed was that the house smelled horrible. I wanted to throw up so bad, but was somehow able to hold my composure. The next room over was the kitchen. The lights were off, but I could see his father sitting at the table hunched over, slack-jawed and drooling. Every few seconds, his neck would twitch, but other than that, he was motionless, his lifeless eyes just staring off into space. And his younger son was no different. He stood in the corner with his back to us, staring intently at the old-fashioned clock, waiting for the New Year countdown. I noticed that the clock was several hours off, but I I wasn't sure if any of them knew. I could also see his mother by the sink, and for some ungodly reason, she was washing the family cat, and the cat was just as spaced out as the rest of them. But somehow, it was the most normal looking living thing in the household. Seeing the whole family together and realizing just how distorted their features were made me sick to my stomach. What all my friends were saying this whole time finally clicked in my head. They all looked like relatives of that weird, malformed brute from the Goonies. I reluctantly took my seat at the table and hoped the night would go better. My boyfriend went to fix me some food by the kitchen counter, leaving me to sit awkwardly with his father. With two hours left until midnight, I tried to make small talk with him. You have a wonderful house. What do you do for work? Don't want to talk, huh? I understand. So, um, how'd you meet your wife? I couldn't get a word out of that man. 
I'm not even sure he knew I was there. I shivered in fear and stopped trying to make conversation. After an eternity passed, my date came back with a plate of food. When he put it down in front of me, I couldn't help but gag as it was just a can of cat food on a crusty plate. I kindly rejected him, saying I wasn't feeling hungry and had lost my appetite. That's when he started yelling at me saying, What? My mom worked hard on cooking that for our New Year's party. You better eat it. But it's just cat food. I can see the can on the counter. He never yelled at me like that before. I was shaken up, but when I called him out on the cat food, he flipped out even more. He gave me this look on his face that a toddler would make when they didn't get what they wanted. What made things more disturbing was how he started to act like one too, grabbing a handful of the cat food and shoving it into his mouth. Seeing a fully grown adult act in such a manner was one of the most disturbing things I had ever seen. The next hour was really awkward. His mother came in from the kitchen to sit with us. I was hoping that she would be talkative, but she looked no less brain dead than her husband. We all sat there in complete silence, while all of them stared off into space, except for my date. He glared at me the entire time, unable to move on from being mad at me for not eating the slop I was offered. I checked my phone, and 12am had finally hit. It was officially New Year's. The mother stood up and kissed the father, but what made things all the more bizarre was when she hobbled over and kissed the little brother, and then... My date. When I say kissed, I don't mean a simple peck on the cheek. It was a full out kiss on the mouth. That's when I knew there was something seriously wrong and I needed to get out of there as soon as possible. But before I could even stand, that giant, freakish man was looming over me. He grabbed my ring finger in a vice grip and started chanting, Together forever. Together forever. Together forever. And that's when I heard his family speak for the first time. Together forever. Together forever. Together forever. He started squeezing my finger so tight that I thought he might break it. Ow, stop it. Let me go. Ow, Ow stop, stop it. it. Let, let me go. go. Shut up. Let go of me. Shut, Shut up. up. Let, let go, go of me. me. Shut up. Let, let go of me. Stop it. Why are you doing this? What's going on? Stop, Stop it. it. Why, Why are you doing this? What's going, going on? on? <laughs> I couldn't comprehend what was going on. All I remember was fighting against his grip like I was fighting for my life. When I finally got free, I bolted straight out of the door. It was snowing outside, but I didn't waste time putting my coat or shoes on. I kept running down the street until I was far enough away to be sure that I wasn't being followed. I then called an Uber and went home. I thought about calling the cops, but I had no idea what I'd even say to them. Since then, I ended up blocking his number and canceling my gym membership just so I could move on and forget all about it. This is one of the most psychotic stories on the channel. Brace yourself. It happened years ago at a McDonald's located in Millville, New Jersey. The photo is intentionally blurred for obvious reasons, so the majority of you may already know what's going on. But for those who don't, here's a dramatized version of the alleged occurrence. One day, I took my daughter out as she passed all of her exams in school, and we decided to indulge in some Big Macs. So, as we entered through the glass doors, I was concerned when I saw my daughter hide behind my back, shaking as she tugged on my pants. What's the matter, Whitney? I thought you loved this place. I asked, patting her on the head to calm her down. Then, moments later, without uttering a word, she pointed a trembling finger at the man by the counter, who was staring at her with a terrifying gaze and unsettling grin. At first glance, it was apparent that he was one of the staff. However, among all the employees there, he was the only one who stood out, and not in a good way. Hence, I approached him and asked, Excuse me, is there something on my daughter's face? If you've got a problem, just tell me. The man didn't say anything. Instead, he laughed and repeatedly glared like someone with a mental disorder. <laughs> I didn't want to offend him even though he gave me the creeps, but I couldn't understand why the restaurant would hire someone like him. I noticed how much free time he had on his hands, since most staff and customers avoided him 90% of the time, treating him like a ghost. I felt sorry for him at one point, because he might have been suffering from a condition that no 
one else understood. So, after leaving my daughter on the chair, I approached the man and allowed him to take my order. I'll have two Big Macs, two large fries, and two sundaes, please. Are you sure you want those, baby? I wouldn't order those if I were you. And why is that? I wouldn't want you to lose those McCurs. How about some cardio at my house later to sweat off the McCalories? Unfazed, I replied politely. No, thank you. My daughter and I have been here several times before, and we order the same thing every time. Once again, he laughed tumultuously, <laughs> catching the attention of everyone in the restaurant. I felt so embarrassed that I instantly regretted giving him a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I raised my hand to call for another staff member, the man grabbed my arm tightly and handed over a Happy Meal box with his other hand, saying, Don't worry, baby. I'll go get your order. Here's a Happy Meal for our date later. Netflix and chill, baby! <laughs> He was so creepy and unprofessional, to say the least. There was a small glimpse of hope when he gave us a free Happy Meal, but that, of course, didn't last. When I opened the Happy Meal box, it was empty. The only thing there was a small hole cut out in the bottom. I instinctively wanted to strike the man in the face. However, seeing my daughter's face reminded me that I was here to celebrate with her. So, to avoid ruining the mood, I simply handed him the payment and ignored him all the way through. Mom, I want to leave. My daughter said, still trembling like she did earlier. Honey, that man is not going to hurt you. Besides, I'm right here. I told her, hoping she'd be more at ease. But then, she pointed to the man again and said, He's still looking at me, though. As I turned my gaze toward the man, he was there idling an elbow on the countertop, constantly giggling as he eyed my daughter maliciously. For a moment, he reminded me of the Joker, who laughed like a maniac minus the green hair or the famous purple suit. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, I saw him conversing with the restaurant's manager, and while he was being reprimanded, all he did was laugh. Finally, having lost his patience, the manager began to threaten the man, saying, If you don't do your job, you're fired! You got that, you piece of shit? So, as the other employees attempted to pacify their manager, the Joker was left with a warning. If he didn't do his job, today would be his last. Some customers were actually spooked by what they saw, prompting them to leave the restaurant. So, moments later, when I was called to the counter to finally get our Big Macs, fries, and ice creams, I was persuaded to do the same thing. As I took the paper bag containing the food, I noticed the lunatic snicker, saying, I hope you enjoy your meal. I had a little extra sauce in there. <laughs> I reluctantly extended my gratitude and left with my daughter. Then, as we got into the car, my daughter opened the paper bag and grumbled about a foul stench. So, naturally, I took a closer look and when I brought it to my nose, I accidentally dropped the paper bag, instantly recognizing the source of this putrid scent. Hence, I picked it up again, and upon inspecting the contents, I saw a brownish substance with the soil's texture. However, based on my experience, I knew too well that it was something a lot more unpleasant than mere soil. Holding my daughter's hand, I stormed back into the restaurant and yelled, Where's the manager? I need to speak with him right now! One of the concerned staff approached me, and asked, What seems to be the problem, ma'am? Perhaps there's a way I can help you without having to inform the manager. The young man pleaded. Tell your manager I'm going to sue this restaurant for poor sanitation and service. I replied, with my arms akimbo. The manager must have heard me screaming, and so he left the office and approached me, apparently concerned. Ma'am, how can I help you? I threw the paper bag on the floor with animosity and said, Is this how you treat your customers? Are you even doing your job as a manager? The food I got has crap in it. Baffled, the manager picked up the paper bag and upon sniffing it, he almost threw up. Moments later, the maniac who had taken my order earlier came to the dining area laughing incessantly. I told you I added something extra! He exclaimed, without a tinge of remorse. What the hell is wrong with you? You're not going to get away with this. Whoever told you I was trying to get away? <laughs> Ha 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 ha
He said, laughing minatorily. Then, in the blink of an eye, he grabbed the paper bag, took the burger, pinned me against the wall, and shoved it in my mouth. Well, how do you like the taste? It's rather unique, isn't it? <laughs> he said, his mouth drooling and his eyes round and menacing. The manager and the other staff tugged on the lunatic's shirt until he fell to the floor. The remaining customers contacted 911, and soon the culprit was arrested. For the next couple of weeks, my daughter would invite me to Burger King instead, unable to move on from the Joker at McDonald's. That's when I realized that he wasn't autistic and that everything he he did was intentional. I'm a 46-year-old male that used to attend a high-end university. I got into a school at a late age and was studying to be a doctor. One of my professors was suddenly absent for an extended period of time without warning and without much explanation as to why he was gone or when he would be coming back. We were left with someone who we'll call Mitchell as our substitute professor. Mitchell was one of those guys in the kiss up to apprentice to tenured professor pipeline. He was very smart and unofficially taught several courses at the school under the wings of a handful of professors who treated him like some kind of academic prodigy. At the end of the day, though, he was just a student like us. Of course, I saw all this about Mitchell years ago, and I made sure to be his friend, mostly for studying purposes. He would call us study buddies as a grown man, being the quirky, geeky personality that you almost have to be in order to be as smart as Mitchell was. He looked the part, too, like the real life stereotype of a nerd in the 80s. He had the big buck teeth with braces, the thick rimmed glasses, the lame haircut, the same boring outfit every day, and he was always carrying a stack of textbooks under his arm when he was going anywhere. I found it amusing when he used the same fork he ate lunch with as a pointer during his lectures, but from being his study buddy, I always knew he had an uncomfortable obsession <laughs> with taking the same fork around in his pocket everywhere he went. Everybody was doing poorly in Mitchell's class. People were dropping out like flies. And it wasn't because he didn't know what he was talking about. It was purely because he was the most gigantic and uncompromising hard ass he could possibly be about everything. Mitchell would cuss you out and humiliate you in front of everyone if you got one of his questions wrong. It was just funny how these quiet little geeky people show their true colors the second they get a bit of power. I was the closest thing he probably ever had to a friend, but that wasn't enough to catch a break. One day, I was so close to failing that I pretty much begged this man for mercy. Hey Mitchell, I appreciate that you're teaching the course while the professor's gone, but if I'm being honest, I'm kind of struggling right now. Do you think there's anything you could do to help me out? Like, maybe some extra credit? <sighs> there's no such thing as extra credit here. But if you need a little extra help, I'd be happy to offer you some extra lessons and tutoring outside of campus. Uh, sure. That'd be great. My place like usual? Dude, this isn't a study buddy session, dear friend. You are my pupil this time. It is only customary that I should host you in my home while I teach you. Sure, I'll see you there. When I got there later that day, I remember Mitchell greeting me as he oddly wore his lab coat. The house seemed totally normal from the outside, but from the inside, I saw that the majority of the space had been turned into a homemade laboratory. Eventually, the two of us sat down by the coffee table and got to business. Mitchell was hopped up on a lot of caffeine, maybe something else too, and was talking a mile a minute like he was reciting the entire textbook of the course by memory. I was struggling to keep up, but I think it was psyching me out more than helping me learn anything. After a little while, Mitchell excused himself to the bathroom. Wow, that coffee's hitting me right in the bread basket. I gotta take a crap. Be right back. Left alone, I took another look around the room. That's when I heard a strange low noise. I couldn't tell what it was, but it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. 
Then I heard it again, and this time I was sure that it was a person. For a moment, I really thought it was the sound of Mitchell grunting animalistically while he rushed his business on the toilet, but I realized it was coming from the wrong direction. In the corner of Mitchell's home lab was a set of hospital curtains that were drawn around something. The sound was coming from behind them. I stood up and began to inch closer. The sound was now way more audible. The grunting was definitely a distressed human. I reached my hand out and quickly yanked back the curtains and saw the most disturbing, blood-curdling thing I have ever seen. Right there was a hairless man laying on top of a hospital bed. He was hooked up to a ventilator and still conscious. I could see an IV drip and a heart monitor hooked up to him. It was apparent that he clearly wasn't being healed here. His face and body were unnatural looking, and I could tell that there was some kind of amateur plastic surgery being done on him. Then it hit me like a ton of bricks. This was my professor, the one that had gone missing from school. He had been here the whole time. I almost threw up at the realization that Mitchell was responsible for all of this, knowing that he was a complete psychotic med student with disturbing intentions. I could barely recognize my professor. He cried silently as he stared at me, clearly begging for me to save him. And then his eyes widened. I'll get you out of here. Don't worry. I backed up slowly and tried to quietly close the curtains, but when I turned around, Mitchell was standing right behind me. I was quick enough to jump out of the way and managed to get around Mitchell and sprint out of the house. When I got to the gas station on the corner, I stopped and pulled out my phone to call the police. By the time the police responded, Mitchell had disappeared without a trace. However, he didn't leave before taking a piece of his pet project as a memento. Approximately seven days later, they discovered Mitchell hiding in one of his relatives' home. Mitchell was immediately apprehended and put behind bars. As for the professor, he miraculously survived and went back to teach the same classes. He now has to wear an eye patch for the rest of his life. But what makes my skin crawl was how it was revealed that Mitchell targeted vulnerable elderly people who trusted him as a friend, student, or doctor. A part of me still thinks Mitchell wanted my eyes, like he did that professor. The new year was just around the corner, and I wanted to celebrate it by going downtown for the countdown. I knew it was tedious since it would take me an hour to reach my destination, but it couldn't be helped because I had no one else to spend New Year's with. What a bummer. I had to live in Canada, moving away from family and friends in the US to accept a once in a blue moon offer that would hopefully help rectify my family's financial issues. So. Even if I didn't want to be alone, sacrifices were necessary. An hour passed, and I finally arrived downtown, surrounded by a massive crowd of about a hundred people. Then, the new year eventually came, enticing every couple and family member to land a kiss on the cheek or lips of their loved ones. It was a bitter pill to swallow, but I must admit that I was dejected, envious of all the people who had someone to share this special occasion with. Nonetheless, there was no reason for me to stay in hibernation mode in my apartment. As I watched the fireworks flutter in the sky, all I could think about was what New Year's resolutions I had planned to set for myself for the following year. As I was bombarded with the soaring crowd, I started getting bumped and pushed around like I was some kind of super featherweight. Then, moments later, I was pushed from behind by some random woman who held her boyfriend close to her. I looked at her, and I could tell she was dismayed by my presence. So, infuriated, she gave me her two cents, saying, Yo, watch her see you stepping on, eh? Don't make me link up my shorty to rush you, little waste you. Dip before I grab my ting. Still. Not wanting to add more insult to injury for the night, I simply apologized and moved away. Having lost my enthusiasm, I decided to shrug it off and wait for the bus heading home. When it finally arrived, 
I wasn't surprised to see that it was empty. After all, everyone else was still downtown partying to their heart's content. I heaved a hefty sigh and alleviated my negative emotions by listening to some Christmas songs on my phone. When I finished paying for my bus fare, my peripheral vision caught sight of a seemingly friendly couple sitting at the back of the bus, seemingly smiling from ear to ear. They sat still with their eyes glued directly towards the seat in front of them, not saying a word. This gave me the impression that they were easy to interact or have conversation with, so Instead of avoiding the opportunity to make new friends, I decided to approach them. However, as soon as I sat across from the couple, hoping to start my first positive interaction of the new year, the man's smile changed into something more malicious as he scanned my body from head to toe, oblivious to his girlfriend sitting beside him. As terrible as this may sound, what I thought would be the start of a friendly conversation gradually became awkward, making it difficult to understand their behavior toward me. Aside from the creep inappropriately checking me out, his girlfriend seemed a tad bizarre, wearing shades despite it being nighttime. However, it was too late to back out now, and so, I forced a smile and said, Happy New Year guys, how's it going? Dismissing my effort to approach them, the man winked at me and said, Hey there beautiful, you looking hot tonight, I'd definitely take you out if you insist. I didn't know how to respond to that, so I kept my mouth sealed as I glanced at his girlfriend, who remained smiling like she wasn't bothered at all. Feeling more awkward than I already was, I nodded my head ever so slightly and thanked the man for his compliment. Thanks, I appreciate that. At one point, the bus drove across a bumpy road where the girl's shades came off her face and dropped to the floor, <gasps> revealing something so frightening that I wanted to get off the bus immediately. <laughs> There she was, a woman looking happy yet gaunt all at the same time, staring directly at me with a pair of round pretentious eyes. A void of darkness surrounded them, giving me the impression that she hadn't slept in ages. I tried to look away, however, the couple's spine-chilling gaze would remain, so knowing there wouldn't be another bus stop until an hour later, I had no choice but to remain seated. Moments later, we came across another bump, and that's when the girl's head snapped to the side, a little past 180 degrees, landing on that guy's shoulder. Oddly enough, the man didn't seem to care at all. He didn't even take a moment to glance at her. He appeared to be so fixated on me that he forgot about her. As the woman continued to stare, I could see her eyes begin to drip with blood, like she was some kind of Bloody Mary in the flesh. I was completely horrified and grossed out, constantly checking the time on my phone, hoping I could just get off the bus. Then, moments later, the man asked, Hey, would you be a helpful little girl and help me bring my drunk girlfriend home? Four hands are better than two, right? Anxious and pessimistically cautious, I politely declined, thinking it could all just be a part of their scheme. However, the man frowned, unable to accept my reply. Well, I'm not asking you to, I'm telling you to. My body trembling, I held my ground and said, I said no, she's not my responsibility. Besides, you're more than capable of taking her home. I don't care, you will do as I say, you understand? I need your help, please ma'am. Without holding back, the man shattered the glass window next to him with unbelievable strength and rage by slamming his fist against it. Hey, what's all the ruckus back there? The bus driver hollered. Mind your business, old man. The tension grew as the bus driver stepped on it, accelerating his speed. Don't provoke me, boy. Then, he came to a sudden halt, glanced at the crazed man, and said, Get off this bus, now. I sat in fear, <laughs> unable to move a muscle as the creep chuckled ominously, heedless of the driver's words. What if I say no? This doesn't have to get ugly, boy. I'll say it one more time. Get the hell off the bus or I'm calling the cops. They glared at each other for a moment until the creep finally caved in, and then he picked up the woman on his shoulder, her eyes still open as they both left the bus. The bus driver proceeded to drive off. I managed to arrive home safely, falling asleep almost instantly due to the stress. But when I turned on the TV to watch the news the following day, the reporter spoke of a man wanted for a potential murder case. Upon seeing the photos on the screen, I covered my mouth in disbelief as I recognized them as the man and the woman from the bus that night. I couldn't help but throw up that morning, wondering if that woman was even alive to begin with, recalling how she stared at me the entire time we were on the bus.